If you have your Bibles, open them to John chapter 16. I'm going to start reading at verse 7 and read down through verse 14. John chapter 16, starting with verse 7 and reading down through verse 14. Please follow with me as I read. <coughs> Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come... He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for our, our friend and our helper, the Holy Spirit of God. In the passage that we read a little bit earlier this, this, uh, this morning from Acts, we had this conversation taking place between Philip and the Spirit of God, where uh, God is, where the Spirit of God is prompting Philip to do something, and he obeys, and he prompts him to do something again, and he obeys, and then when he's done, the Spirit of God catches him away. And we, we just have this wonderful helper that we just don't tap, that we don't appreciate, that we don't sometimes even acknowledge. And sometimes that's because we are afraid. So I pray, Father, that you'll help us as we work through this fear this morning to dispel it and to help us to appreciate the Holy Spirit of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have children's church for the kids, so they'll be bringing them out here as uh, we begin our message. There's a bedtime story that you're familiar with. The bedtime story is the three little pigs. And the three little pigs, as you remember, built three little houses to dwell in. And as they're building these houses, they're singing a song. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Well... Before it was all over, two of them were inside the wolf. So they had reason to be afraid of the big bad wolf. But before the, the disaster overtook them, they sang this song to bolster their confidence and hide their fears. Unfortunately for two of them, they had very real reason to fear. Fear is a part of life. We talk about the uh, fight or flight reflex in people and there is there is an adrenaline rush that comes with that and part of that is uh, the result of the fear of what has confronted a person it's a part of life sometimes it is life saving sometimes it is unreasonable and what robs us of the quality of life experts tell us for instance with respect to this idea of being robbed of the quality of life that most of the things we worry over the potential events that we fear are going to harm us never come to pass. Not just 51%, but like 90 to 95% of the things we fear never come to pass. But we still succumb to fear. To demonstrate that, psychologists now list well in excess of 700 phobias. Apparently, no one is immune from fearing something. Those phobias, those fears, can be legitimate, and they can be, shall we say, unusual. There are some legitimate phobias. For instance, sclerophobia is the fear of crime. It's not a bad thing to be afraid of crime. Not maybe cowering in the corner, but taking steps to be sure that you're safe. Hamartophobia. Harmartophobia is the fear of sinning. Hopefully you all have the fear of sinning and don't really want to do that. 
Hadeophobia is for those who don't have the fear of sinning. It's the fear of hell. <laughs> so they're on their way because they don't have a fear of sinning, I guess. And then there is odontophobia, which is the fear of oral surgery, and I certainly have that fear. Then there are some unusual phobias, and I'm going to have trouble pronouncing a couple of these, so bear with me. Arachabuterophobia. You're going to see it up there in just a second. It is the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. Some of you have this next one right now. It is called homilophobia, which is the fear of sermons. <laughs> Related to that is helenologophobia, which is, I didn't pronounce that correctly, but you'll, you'll, you'll get it, which is the fear of Greek words. <laughs> I have that one. And then there is this one that I have a hard time finding, but, uh, but is apparently a legitimate... Um, that is a legitimately listed phobia, and this is the hardest one of all to pronounce. It's asculusglabrophobia, asculusgrabophobia. It's the fear of buckeyes. <laughs> I have that one too. I don't know what the word is for the fear of wolverines, but it hasn't been seen during the football season for more than a decade. This morning we're going to deal with a fear that fundamental Baptist people have developed over time. An unreasonable and destructive fear that we must conquer. It's not one that's listed on the psychologist's list, but I've called it pneumophobia, the fear of the Holy Spirit. We're afraid of him because he's largely unknown and misunderstood. So there is, in a sense, a fear of the unknown in our fear of the Holy Spirit. We're afraid of him because he is always with us, and he knows every thought and action, and so there is a fear of conviction with respect to the Holy Spirit. We're afraid of him because he may lead us to serve God on some distant field, or in some difficult way, or he may take our children far away from us and place them in service to the king. And so there is the fear of serving God instead of ourselves. And we're afraid of him because some have reacted emotionally to the Holy Spirit's ministry. And we react the other way. And so we're afraid of him because someone might raise their hands in public worship. Or someone might sing a song about the Holy Spirit. Or someone might make a comment like, the Holy Spirit led me, or the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And we say, <laughs> We're fundamental Baptists, and we don't believe in that. And so we become afraid of him, and we push him away because in the back of our minds we think maybe, just maybe, the charismatics are right. We can't stand for that. So we just ignore the Spirit of God, hoping he will go away. And as Bible-believing Baptist people, we have become afraid of the Holy Spirit. We worry that he might do this or that, or that, he might drop, or that we might drop off into the confusion of Pentecostalism. And by the way, lest you think that I'm thinking that the charismatic movement is correct, I do not think that. And you'll see, if you haven't already seen that, you'll see it as we move along. We've decided to take the safe course and just ignore him altogether. In essence, we have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. That's a mistake. It is a major mistake. We have... No better friend in the Christian life than the Holy Spirit of God. It is the, he is the personal gift from our Savior to us when he left earth. We only hurt ourselves when we ignore him and the work that he does on our behalf. What I want to do this morning is I want to look at seven ways in which he is a friend to us. I want you to notice, first of all, that our friend is personal. And I will pray, this is Jesus speaking, the Father, and he will give you another helper 
that he may abide with you forever. That he, he may abide with you forever. This is one of those places, only one of the places, where the Bible refers to the Holy Spirit in terms that are personal and in terms that demonstrate his personal interest in us. Our knowledge of him, a personal in-depth knowledge, comes from the fact that he lives in our hearts. This is not a long-range relationship. Earth to Holy Spirit, right? This is not Mork calling Ork. This is the Holy Spirit of God living within us. This is not a photos and letters friend. The Holy Spirit is like a roommate, only closer. Because he lives where I live. He goes where I go. He's with me when I sleep and when I rise. He understands my deepest loves, my deepest desires, and my deepest fears. He knows my failings. And he's not there to beat me over the head with them. He's there to help me through them. And to help me get stronger so that those failings don't over, overwhelm me. How well do you know the Holy Spirit of God? Well, I can tell you that He knows you very well. He is a personal friend. The second thing I want you to notice is that our friend is a paraclete. Go back to chapter 16 and look at verse 7. A what? A paraclete, and the definition of that word is one called alongside to help. One called alongside to help. Verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage. Think about this. Jesus is telling his disciples that he's going away, and that will be better for them if he goes away. It is to your advantage if I leave. Why? For if I do not go away, the one called alongside to help will not come to you. But if I, will, but if I depart, I will send him to you. Well, who called him? Our Savior called him alongside to help. Jesus called him alongside. He's the one that prayed the Father. The Father sends him, but Jesus is the one who said, Will you send the Holy Spirit? Why? Well, to help us understand God, for one. When we get to the end of the passage, we'll see that. And to help us live as God intends. Some of the things the Holy Spirit does for us are to help us live in a way that God, that will honor God and will please God and that God intends for us to live. That's the purpose of his work. Now, that doesn't sound scary, does it? When we've got somebody who's coming alongside to help. Now, sometimes people will say to someone who's coming alongside to help, well, I don't want your help. And sometimes that's how we respond to the Holy Spirit. But typically the one that's coming alongside is saying, I'm here to help. I'm here as a minister to you. I'm here for your good. I'm here to be someone you can lean on, to be someone you can learn from, to be someone who will, who will be your friend and your support. His job, which was given to him by our Savior, is to pick up, for, uh, pick up for us where Christ left off. Jesus walked with and talked with and taught and counseled and connected and demonstrated God's love to those who were his followers while he was here on earth. John 14, verse 16, tells us that the Holy Spirit is another helper, another person who will walk with and talk with and teach and counsel and correct and demonstrate God's love. In fact, there are two Greek words for the word that's translated by the English word another. One is another of a different kind. That's not the one used here. The word another that's used here is another of the same kind. I will send you another helper of the same kind that I have been. So Jesus is saying, you're going to have someone living in your heart who will be just like me. 
So for those of us who have become followers of Christ since 33 AD, the Holy Spirit walks with us and talks with us and counsels us and teaches us and corrects us and loves us just as Christ did. He's the one sent to help us walk with God, just as Jesus helped his disciples while he was on earth to walk with God. Now, that's pretty cool. When you think about that, that's, people will often say, I wish I had lived when Jesus was living. You have everything that the Holy Spirit, or that, that the disciples had living with you. You have the Spirit of God, the another of the same kind of helper that the disciples had. You know, Peter and John and the rest of the disciples had Jesus for three years. And then he was gone. And they lived the rest of their lives the same way we live ours, with the help of the Holy Spirit of God, Amen. the helper that was called alongside to help. The third thing I want you to notice is in the book of Ephesians. So if you'll turn back to that, we'll come back to John in a little bit. Our friend, thirdly, is protective. We won't turn to these passages, but in John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, Jesus told his disciples, the world hates me and it'll hate you too. Don't be surprised by that. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter told his readers that Satan walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we have an enemy in the world, we have an enemy in Satan. And our own flesh, which we saw as self in opposition to God just here recently, would like to rise up and destroy us as well. And we see that in that passage in Galatians chapter 5, where the works of the flesh are detailed, and they are very destructive. So we have three enemies, the world itself, Satan himself, and our own flesh. Two of the three are from outside, but the one acts like a fifth column and attacks from within. A news flash. You're not going to beat them alone. You're just not. Nobody else will either. We don't have the power to overcome all that. But we don't have to have the power to come overcome all that because we don't fight this battle alone. We fight alongside the Holy Spirit, who is our protector. Look at chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him that is in Christ, you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And then over chapter 4 and verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That idea of being sealed is the protection from the destructive powers of Satan and his wicked allies all the way through this life and into glory. See, those two verses say, you're guaranteed victory. Amen. I mean, that's pretty cool, isn't it? To go into a fight knowing you're going to win? I know I'm going to win. Now, are there going to be battles along the way where I struggle and stumble? Yes. Am I going to win the fight? Yes. Because I'm sealed to the day. By whom? By the Holy Spirit. He's our protector. The fourth thing I want you to see is back in the book of John in chapter 14. And that, that is that he is our partner. John chapter 14. We're looking at verse 17. Verse 16, which we read earlier, I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Notice the phrase, with you, dwells with you. That's indicative of partnership. Now let's consider a few examples. In Galatians chapter 5, the, the verses that follow on the heels of those uh, works of the flesh is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, 
gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, or self-control. The fruit of the Spirit are character traits that the Holy Spirit seeks to build into our lives. He partners with us to produce this fruit in us so that, so that we can be all that the Father wants us to be and so that we can have the impact that God wants us to have, so that we can live the life the way God wants us to live it. So he partners with us in Christian living. He produces the fruit, and we live it. He also partners with us in prayer. In Romans chapter 8, and verse 26, go ahead and turn there. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Obviously, prayer is one of those weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So he is our partner in prayer. He helps us know what to pray for. And he personally packages and escorts our prayers into the presence of our Father. So we have this helper, not only in walking day by day, but in our prayer life as well. When you pray, you are literally in partnership with the Holy Spirit. The moment you say, Father, in prayer, you're in partnership with the Holy Spirit, and He and you are working together to pray. And then finally in service, 1 Corinthians, go ahead and turn there as well, chapter 12. and verse 11. Actually, all of chapter 12 here is about the gifts of the Spirit. But in verse 11 it says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. He provides us with gifts and abilities so that we can serve the Lord. We are God's servants. And the Holy Spirit comes alongside to give us the tools we need to serve effectively. He's our partner. He is more powerful and more wise to be sure, but our partner just the same. The fact that you have a partner who is more powerful and more wise than you doesn't mean he's not your partner. It just means that you're very fortunate to have such a wonderful partner. And we do. He is constantly working with us, upholding us, helping us as we seek to live the Christian life. And then our friend is perfect. Back to the book of Isaiah, Old Testament. Chapter 40. It's kind of interesting that we're going back here because the Holy Spirit's ministry in the Old Testament was different than it is in the New Testament. But verse 13 tells us something very important about the person of the Holy Spirit. It's a couple of questions. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or as his counselor, who has taught him? Those are rhetorical questions. The answer is no one. Because no one is going to direct the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has, is the mind of God. And the result of that is that nobody's going to tell him, well, this is a better way to do things. Or I think you ought to reconsider what you're doing with this particular believer. That's not how things work. The Spirit of God is perfect. Now, how many of your friends can lay claim to that? If you count me as a friend, I can't lay claim to that. If I count you as a friend, you can't lay claim to it for me either. But the Holy Spirit can. He is perfect. He will never make a mistake. He will never guide you down a wrong path. He will never prompt you to do something wrong, never teach you something false, never slip for a moment, never allow you to lose your salvation, praise God. And never expect you to do something for which he has not adequately prepared you. When you say to God, when God prompts you to do something, and you say to God, I can't do that, what you're telling God is, you didn't do your job. I'm not ready. If God calls you, he'll equip you. If the Holy Spirit of God leads you in a direction, he'll make sure that you're ready for that. Now, you may have to grow in the process. Nothing wrong with that. 
But you're ready. If he's calling you, you're ready. He will never, never blow it. He will also never forget that a true friend loves, who loves us will sometimes take us aside, take us to the woodshed, and correct us. Even rebuke us. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 6 tells us that there are some wounds that are faithful. That is, they are, they are given from a person who is faithful. And those are the wounds of a friend. And we have a friend in the Holy Spirit. When we need to be corrected, he'll correct us. But he'll do it because he loves us, not because he wants to get a pound of flesh. Very important difference between those. Our sixth thought is that our friend is a provider. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 7 and 13, if you'll go back to the New Testament with me. Verse 7 says, The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all been made to drink into one Spirit. Uh, the Spirit is a giver. He provides a lot of things. He provides new life for us because he is the one who regenerates us. So as the regenerator, he provides new life. He provides a new family. In verse 13, it says, By one spirit we were all baptized into one body or one family. He provides us with a new family because he's the baptizer. He provides us with a new relationship because he's the indweller. Prior to our salvation, we don't have the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. But once we become children of God, the Holy Spirit now lives in us. That's what Jesus promised. He's going to abide with you. Live with us. And we have a new relationship because he is the indweller. We have a guarantee for eternity because he is the sealer, as we saw just a moment ago. He provides help as the comforter. In fact, the word comforter is not how it's translated in the New King James. It's, It's translated the helper. It's the same idea, the one called alongside to help. He provides understanding as our teacher. He provides direction as our guide. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he provides spiritual gifts as the giver. He's not a Scrooge. A lot of people look at God and say, well, God doesn't want me to know things. He doesn't want me to understand. He doesn't want me to... And basically, that was, that's a lie of Satan. And that's the lie that Satan used to trap Eve. Do you remember that? God doesn't want you to know. God knows that as soon as you know, you'll be like him. And he doesn't want that. So God's hiding things from you. And we bought into that throughout our lives. What's the will of God? I don't know. He's hid it from me. See, God's not interested in hiding things from you. God is interested in moving you along and helping you to live the life that he has intended for you. He's not a Scrooge. He's not hanging on to the good stuff we need in a miserly way. He's dishing out God's bounty, not grudgingly with an eyedropper, but with open arms because he is a bountiful provider. And then finally, our friend is permanent. We come full circle, go back to the book of John in chapter 14, and look at verse 16 again. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. He's not leaving anytime soon. In fact, he's not leaving ever. All that he is and all that he has to offer is ours now and for eternity. Now, we have have a blessing in, in our era that people in the Old Testament time didn't necessarily have. You think of Saul. We talked a little bit about Saul in Sunday school. You think of Saul and the fact that the Holy Spirit of God came upon Saul at a point in time and then left him when he abandoned God. When he decided he was going to go his own way and do his own thing, the Holy Spirit left him. Well, that doesn't happen to us. When you become a child of God, the Holy Spirit is your helper permanently, forever, according to Jesus. I've had friends who were less than permanent. 
I'm sure you have as well. Sometimes we will use the term fickle. They're there during the good times. Kind of the prodigal son type friends. Remember those guys? Prodigal son leaves and while he's flush with cash, they love him. Once he runs out of money, they're all gone again. His friends were really friends of his money, not of him. People that will use you, maybe even abuse you and then abandon you when you're no longer useful to them. Well, the Holy Spirit is not that kind of a friend. His friendship lasts. It is forever. It is eternal. Like the really good friend that he is, he sticks with us through thick and thin, even when we're not very likable. And that's a good friend. You know, I've, I've had some friends over the course of my lifetime that stuck with me when I was not a very likable person. I'm married to one of them. That's a friend. The friend that says, the first time you do something really stupid, the friend that says, well, that's enough of you, I've had it. It wasn't your friend to start with. At least not a good friend, not a close friend. The Holy Spirit isn't like that. Will he be grieved with us from time to time? Yes, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can even shut him up, quench the Holy Spirit. But you can't drive him away as your friend. He's still there. Still loves you. Still will work for you. Still will minister to you, even when you're not all that God wants you to be. So how do I respond to this friend? What relationship should I have with him? For many of us in the um, fundamental Baptist circles, our relationship has been academic and impersonal, cold, and even wary. Now that wasn't always true, but over the course of the last century or so, there's been such misunderstanding with respect to the ministries of the Holy Spirit that we've almost backed away from Him and said, yeah, we believe in the Trinity, there's three of them. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Just don't want to talk about Him. Because it scares us. We might drift off into some Pentecostalism of some kind. But that's not what He wants. Given our complete dependence on Him, it's not what we should want either. The best friend you will ever have is living right inside your heart. Statistics tell us that most people who walk through the front door of a church are not looking for a theology, they're looking for a friend. Seven out of ten, is what they tell us, are looking for friendship. Especially in our day, most of them already know what you believe. They've been on the internet and figured it out. So when they walk in the door, they're wondering whether anybody here will like me, whether anybody here will be my friend, whether there's a place here for me, whether I can fit here. If I can, and it's great. If I can't, I'll find someplace else where I can. Friendship is important to people. Well, the very best friend you're ever going to have is living inside your own heart. So how do you respond to this friend? Let me give you three thoughts as we close by way of application. Number one, treat him as a person. Interact. Study about him in the Word, but even more so, get to know him. Understand who he is and what he's trying to do in your life. Acknowledge him. Take advantage of his presence. He says he's giving you a gift. Figure out what it is or what they are. He says he's here to help. Take advantage of the help. Treat him as a person. If you had a friend and the friend consistently wanted to help you and you consistently ignored that friend, wouldn't that be unkind of you to do that? Well, with the Holy Spirit of God, treat him as a person. He's here to help. Second, respond to his will. And by the way, this is one way you can treat him as a person. Respond to his will. When he leads, follow. When he prompts you to pray, pray. You know, if you wake up at 2 in the morning, you're thinking about something, 
it probably isn't just because you woke up at 2 in the morning and were thinking about something. As a believer, it's probably the Holy Spirit of God saying, you need to be praying about this. You need to focus on this. So you're awake anyway. Pray. Lay it in front of the Lord. So, well, what if it wasn't the Holy Spirit? How much is it going to hurt you if you pray about it? Just follow his lead. Follow his promptings. When he teaches, pay attention. When, you, when you're reading through your Bible and all of a sudden, boom, something just launches off the page. I don't know about you. I've been saved now for well over 50 years. And I've been reading my Bible through every year for not that many, but a long time. Probably 20, 25 years. And so I'll read through my Bible. I get, to, get, to, get to a certain spot and something comes off the page and I'll think to myself, I have never, ever noticed that. I've been reading this, Bible, this, this book every day for 20 years, and I've never noticed that. Well, pay attention. That's the Holy Spirit of God saying, boom, I got something I want to, to teach you here. Here's something you need to pay attention to. Here's something you ought to learn, something I want you to know. When he corrects, submit. Well, how does he correct? As an unsaved person, you have a conscience, but it's seared. You know what a seared piece of meat is? That's your conscience as an unsaved person. It doesn't function the way it's supposed to because it has been burnt. The nerves are not, the nerve endings aren't working the way they're supposed to. But the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to restore that conscience, begins to work through your conscience and to prompt you when things are not right. If you've got this sense that you shouldn't do something, don't do it. As a believer, take a step back. You never have to act right now and do something you say but later on you'll say boy i wish i hadn't done that if you've got this sense you should do something follow his will and do it let him be your conscience when he commands obey in short open yourself up to the work that he's doing in your life and respond to it so treat him as a person and respond to his will and finally be confident in him your perfect and trustworthy and permanent friend and partner will never fail you and never steer you wrong. You, have, you can have all the confidence that it's possible to have in the Spirit of God. He will always do what's right. You can trust your holy friend. Who's afraid of the Holy Ghost? Unhappily, many of us. But unlike the three little pigs, we have no reason to fear. He's not out to eat us. He's out to help us. And we have no reason to fear our friend.